All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Just going to give it a few more seconds for others to join. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, I am Giannina Christman. I'm the head of career development at Macaulay Honors College. Um, I so appreciate the team at Pfizer for joining us and um, hosting this information session um, at Macaulay. So I'll go ahead and hand it over in a few seconds um, to Tracy Boyden. Um, please make sure to stick around until the end of the session. We will be sharing a poll um, just to get your evaluation and your feedback um, for today's event. And so I'll go ahead and turn it over to the Pfizer team. Tracy, go ahead. Perfect. So thank you guys. Hopefully you're having a great day. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Tracy Boyden. I'm here with several of my colleagues to talk to you about the role and the work that we do at Pfizer. We work in a, a group called Pharmacokinetics, Dynamics and Metabolism or PDM. When you look across industry, you may also find that this group is called DMPK, PKDM, drug metabolism. Um, but hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll have a little better understanding of the work that we do within this group. So Pfizer has been in the news most recently. It may not have been sort of a common name that you were aware of before, but certainly the work that we've done recently with BioNTech to develop one of the COVID vaccines has really brought Pfizer to the forefront. But prior to that and continuing in the background behind the vaccine and some of the other COVID programs that we're working on, we have just a, a plethora of medicines that we have delivered to the world to help prevent a variety of different ailments and diseases. Um, everything from Prevnar 13 to our pneumococcal vaccine to cancer treatments, um, anti-inflammatory treatments for different skin diseases, such as um, our, our uh, tofacitinib Zelgance program. And, and just to show you that we have many, many other programs that are, are sort of in the works, and we'll talk about some of those as we go forward as well. At Pfizer, we have four primary research locations. Groton, Connecticut and Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the folks here online are from those sites, but we also have research locations in La Jolla, California and Boulder, Colorado. I've had the honor of visiting all of these except Boulder. So hopefully after the COVID pandemic and we are allowed to do more traveling, I can get myself to Boulder. Um, but each of these sites are very unique um, in the area that they are located but all of the buildings and all of the office and lab spaces are really designed to create a very positive work environment, a, ve a very inspiring work environment um, with lots of just green space and outdoor space, places to come and, and think and innovate. Um, they're, they're all just very unique, but very special um, research locations. At Pfizer, we embrace diversity and promote a culture of inclusion. And I think in order to move at the speed of science, which has become sort of an acronym internal to Pfizer, but also external to the world, to deliver the highest quality medicines that we can in the fastest way that we can, we really need to have that diverse workforce. Um, it brings different perspectives where teams can flourish and where people feel valued for having different ideas to bring to the table. One of the ways that we really embrace their diversity and inc inclusion um, in our workforce is through colleague resource groups or CRGs. And they're just groups of colleagues who come together in it's a community and drive diversity. Um, they use opportunities to get together to do professional networking and mentorship. And at Pfizer, there's over 90 different colleague resource groups and they're open to everyone to join. And these resource groups really try to exemplify the Pfizer core values, which are listed here of courage, excellence, equity, and joy. Our R&D therapeutic areas or our research and development areas that Pfizer has decided to really focus on fall into the areas you see here from oncology, internal medicine, vaccines, inflammation and immunology, and rare diseases. And as you can see at the bottom here, this is what we call our pipeline. But really when we talk about right now, in as of February of early this year, we have in phase one, which are 
programs that are just entering testing in human, about 27 different programs or different potential molecules that will become drugs eventually, all the way through to nine of what we call registration. And so the hope is by the end of this year that we will have nine brand new medicines to bring to the world that fall within these different therapeutic areas. Our group PDM fits in to developing uh, or discovering those drugs in, in a way that uh, it sort of spans a huge amount of time when you think of the progression of a drug. So it's a very long road to find that new medicine. There are folks within PDM that start here or focus most of their research here, but there are also others of us that work at the very maybe end game as well in the development of a new medicine. I like this graphic because it really sort of, you think of it as a funnel to its side. At, at the very early stage, there may be hundreds of thousands of different compounds to try to hit a target or to elicit a certain effect to become a drug. And really the ADME science group or the PDM group, our group, works to really help define or thin down the compounds that make it through that funnel that then get tested into human. And then we work to really help refine the, the results that we see in human to find that one molecule that becomes that approved medicine. This continuum can take anywhere from 12 to 15 years, believe it or not, um, from when it's just a, an idea from a biologist or a chemist to something that is actually a pill in a bottle at the end, end game. As I mentioned, our group sort of spans this entire continuum. Um, listed here inside these little rocks that look like bubbles, little bubbles that look like rocks here, are, are the PDM groups or disciplines that help to move compounds through this continuum. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about some of these. But as I mentioned before, our group is a very diverse scientific group. We bring a lot of different backgrounds in order to provide the impact that we need across this continuum. Our PDM group interfaces with many different, um, there's many different disciplines that all kind of culminate and come together through a project rep. And we'll talk a little bit more about this role within our group. These bubbles here that you see on the left-hand side that are the blue bubbles are ones we'll talk about in a little more detail. But the results from all of these, this work and these disciplines that are happening really culminate through the project rep and then Information is shared with our chemistry colleagues, our farm sci colleagues, clinical pharmacology, biology, and drug safety colleagues as well. And all that conduit really happens through that project rep role. So as I mentioned, we all come from diverse backgrounds. Um, some of us are heavy in biology, chemistry, biochemistry, pharmaceutical sciences. Some of us have very specific key um, uh, training in ADME sciences and pharmacokinetics. Typically, if you come into our organization at an entry level, it can be somebody with ooh, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. And that's usually comes in at the associate scientist or senior scientist level. And then folks that come into our organization with PhDs usually enter into that senior principal or senior principal scientist role. We also have quite a few colleagues within our organization that have MBAs as well. So, and when we think of the, the continuum here, the, one of the first groups that kind of gets to touch molecules or to work with some of the compounds that can become medicines potentially is our hit discovery and optimization group. They have knowledge in the biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and they use sort of a very high throughput screening method to begin that narrowing down of the funnel, so to speak. So they're touching hundreds of thousands of compounds. They reply a lot of robotic automation, liquid handling, mass spec type of analyses. Um, they use high throughput assays to really give that feedback to chemistry to say, hey, we need to change this molecule in such a way that we have more druggable properties. And they use the information to optimize and to drive that chemistry. When we talk about the ADME piece, ADME, that's the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of a molecule. And there are certain types of assays that we can establish that help answer questions around the ADME. And some of them are shown here. Uh, we have ways to do predictions around whether eventually this could lead to a drug interaction. We have ways to 
get the best properties to have the best type of clearance for a molecule, um, transporters as well, as well as different permeability that you might need for absorption factors. So these folks work very early on in that basic research into the drug discovery phase, touching a lot of molecules. They partner really well with the computational ADME group within our organization. You know, these, these folks are really looking at hundreds and thousands of, of compounds to look at trends, to do predictions, to say, hey, if we change the molecule in such a way, this makes the ADME property, the absorption property, or the distribution property much better for this program. So they have a lot of knowledge in computer programming um, and statistics. They're really adept at data mining and setting those trends and really driving programs forward. Um, they have assays that help to maximize the value of these ADME properties. And, and they use AI, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning to optimize the property. So it's, it's pretty impressive what they do along with the HIT, the, 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 this group here, the HIT Discovery Optimization Group. But really they're touching the molecules at the very beginning stage of the drug discovery. One of the other groups that works within PDM is a modeling and simulation group. And or we call them, you know, PKPD. PK is pharmacokinetics or the exposure of a drug. And PD is the pharmacodynamic um, part of the drug or the, the efficacy part or the, the, the pharmacology end. And so they're partnering with the biology piece to make sure that we have a dose that gives us the proper response. So we have enough exposure or the right kind of exposure that will allow the drug to get to its target and then elicit the effect. Mm -hmm. These folks, again, backgrounds with stimu sim computer simulation, biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and they're using these models to help visualize what's going to happen with the molecule. Is it gonna to get to its target? Are we gonna elicit the efficacy? And if not, you know, what can be happening? The graphic here, he sort of shows, you know, that gray area, that complex biology. So they have a very adept understanding of physiological systems and trying to feed back to, you know, the, the ADME group or the chemistry group, you know, any changes that might be needed in order to get the efficacy or get the binding or the non-binding to the target. Um, they use a lot of math and statistical analyses and then just have that very strong physiological relationship in order to do predictive properties. The folks here really get involved also in the phase one stage when we wanna do predictions to what, what's gonna happen with all of our in vivo or in vitro data that we've gathered early on, but what's gonna, how does that all interplay when we get into human? What can we predict will happen to human? So they have a very strong understanding of, of a lot of the physiology that's involved. Our biotransformation, enzymology and transporter group, um, we easily could have split these groups apart and talked about them, but huge impact here. Um, they have very strong understanding of biology, biochemistry and, and chemistry. You know, their role falls at the preclinical stage to help drive the correct molecule or some of the best molecules that we're gonna talk about um, or look at in human, which is what we call phase one. But also once a molecule is in human, they're highly involved with sort of teasing out what happens to the drug. We talked about the absorption phase, which is where some of our transporter folks would get involved. But what about the metabolism phase? Um, we have to make sure that we have a very clear understanding of what how biochemically the drug is changed when it enters your body. It's a foreign substance. Your body is going to change it biochemically, molecularly, in order to excrete it, to get rid of it within the system. And so this group uses different analytical technologies, um, bioanalytical methodologies, mass spectrometry, to elicit what happens to that parent molecule, we call it, or the molecule that was actually dosed, how is it cleaved? How is it changed um, metabolically? So we can have a clear understanding to make sure that we're not creating a metabolite that could be dangerous or that we're not creating a metabolite that we then have to account for, for the efficacy part of, of the uh, program. And so they have a very strong understanding of different phases of oxidative versus conjugative metabolism. Um, they help elicit the excretion routes. So are we having any renal or kidney 
transporter type of, um, you know, extra hepatic recirculation happening here? Is it excreted through the bile? These are all things that we have to understand. Um, regulatory agencies will want to know this information before they'll ever allow it to be tested into human. So this group does an amazing job um, really pulling in the enzymatic transporter biochemical properties and that physiological relationship to kind of optimize what's going to happen to the, what's the fate of the molecule, what ultimately will happen to it. We talked earlier about the project rep, and that was the person that was sort of at the center of the, that hub of all of the folks that work within PDM. And the project rep helps pull it all together. Um, they are folks that have a pretty broad and very in-depth understanding of ADME, of, of the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, how it all fits together. And they apply that knowledge in order to guide teams to say, this molecule is better than this one, and this is why. You know, one of the important parts that they're involved in is making sure that these therapeutic indices or making sure that when we're going to elicit the effect, we're going to do it in such a way that we're not going to hit any toxicity. And so certain therapeutic areas will allow us to have a very narrow therapeutic index. Index, And when you think of a TI that's very narrow, you can think of oncology, a lot of cancer drugs where, you know, it's okay if maybe we elicit a certain side effect, but we're also right at that efficacy, you know, range, it can be tolerated in oncology, where maybe it can't be tolerated, say, in a medication for, you know, a, a skin disorder. So there's a lot that plays into what's acceptable for certain ADME properties and different programs, and they use their understanding to really help advise clinical, um, what they can expect for outcomes and, and around the safety of the molecules. So they partner with our drug safety colleagues very closely. So they have a collective knowledge of that information, really kind of overall pulling it all together and kind of telling that story as we nominate a compound from that preclinical stage into phase one, which is that first time it's tested in a human. So all of the great science that is done has to be reported out to regulatory agencies. So we have a group within our organization that helps that process, taking that preclinical information, talking about it in such a way um, that we put it into summary reports that are then put into other types of documents that go out to every country in the world has certain regulations that we have to make sure we follow. But it really boils down to making sure that we have really good data quality and compliance. So things are noted in notebooks, electronic notebooks, um, and that we are making sure that everything's verified and it's pulled together in just a very short logical type of explanation. So we don't get a lot of questions back when we send these you know, packets to the regulatory agencies. What was interesting is I have been at Pfizer long enough, but I can't remember the drug, Doug, you might, and maybe you can talk about it later, but years ago, these packets were literally printed pieces of paper. And I remember there was either one or two trailer trucks, and it may have been for like uh, Zoloft, one or two trailer trucks just full of documents that went to the agencies. You know, nowadays, everything is electronic. So as you can imagine, there's certain ways that we have to present the information, because a lot of electronic scanners are used to glean information very quickly. And so we have to make sure all of that is done correctly so we don't hold up those uh, submissions. But this group is involved very early on all the way through post-marketing um, requirements that may be um, made by certain regulatory agencies. And then there's also another group that works around the environmental risk. These folks have maybe a little bit more industrial hygiene or toxicology type of background. And they apply the knowledge of all the ADME properties and really trying to understand what happens to compounds and how they actually can affect the environment. Um, they and analyze compounds or samples to help identify the, the fate of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Um, you know, hopefully you've all been told and none of you have ever done it, you know, to sort of, you know, flush pharmacy, you know, prescriptions that you no longer use. You don't ever want to do that. Um, but, but these folks are really trying to understand how does it become degraded or biodegraded. This is all part of a requirement by different countries to make sure that we have this information. So there's this group works in this specialty area, very later stage. So they're touching molecules that have been in humans and will soon be um, a drug that's basically put into a bottle. So this is our team 
Um, I guess at this point, probably what I will do is maybe stop chatting so much about what we do. Um, we thought what would, might be helpful is to just take a little bit of time for the folks here that are online and just talk about how we got where we are at Pfizer. You know, how did we, get, what was our career path? So um, I guess since I'm already rolling, I might as well continue that. Um, right now, I work in that regulatory area, um, have been for the last 10 years. I've been at Pfizer over 30 years and started as in the lab and then became a project rep, um, really pulling all of the PDM information together. But I have to say now my job is, I love it the best. Um, for the last 10 years, it's just taking all that information and making sense of it all into a really neat story. Um, as an undergrad, I actually thought I was gonna be a biology high school teacher. Um, that was kind of what I went to college to do. But once I started in the science labs and science classes, I knew there was more I wanted to do other than just teach. Uh, it is still a passion of mine. And hopefully at some point when the world gets back to normal, I will maybe teach at a college level. But um, that's, that's kind of how I got here. So um, Doug, did you wanna talk a little bit? Sure, I, I can go next. Um, so my undergraduate degree is in chemistry. I like that the best amongst the sciences. <clears throat> um, I had the chance to work in a analytical lab uh, one summer. And so if you if you ever do get the chance to do internships, that, that's a great way to learn something that you, you, know, you may not be exposed to. And so that was really what made me decide that I wanted to go to, to graduate school. And, um, you know, when I started to learn about careers for chemists, um, what I mostly learned about was chemists that synthesize molecules and work in pharmaceutical companies. So that's that's how I entered graduate school, thinking where my career was going to take me. Uh, it turned out my advisor <clears throat> had a, a really big interest in biological systems. And so I got interested in that as well. And so after I finished my graduate training, um, I had to do a, a postdoctoral training. And at that point, um, you know, I, I found something that was biologically related. And that was a, a, a direction that I didn't anticipate when I entered graduate school. So, you know, you, you want to keep your, your mind open to possibilities the doors that may open to you that you may not expect. Um, that turned out to be a, <clears throat> a great lead in to my first job was in a drug metabolism department. And I, I spent two years at that company and then I, I came to Pfizer. Um, I worked as a project rep. Um, you saw that role described by Tracy for about eight years. Um, I worked in the area of neuroscience. We were studying drugs for Alzheimer's and depression and anxiety and, and different things. And, uh, for about the last 10 or so years, I guess a little bit longer than that, um, I've been the manager, the supervisor of the biotransformation group. So um, um, had the opportunity to you know, work on a lot of different projects, work with a lot of really great people. And um, you know, we get to do some really fun and, and exciting and impactful science at Pfizer. James, do you wanna go next? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to go next. I think uh, we have a pretty similar story, actually. So, you know, when I was in uh, at Hofstra for my undergraduate degree, I was a chemistry major, and I really liked research. I really liked uh, what I was learning in my classes, you know, and and that ranged from, you know, inorganic chemistry to organic chemistry, even to some biochemistry. Um, but what I, you know, I had the same impression that if I wanted to go into a pharmaceutical position, um, I was going to really have to focus my chemistry on synthesis and, and work on making the drugs. Um, and so when I, you know, when I was thinking about next steps, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school, get my PhD so that I can continue along that path. Um, and when I rotated, uh, I, I went to Vanderbilt University. And when I rotated, I, I specifically chose to try some other labs that were not just synthesis. I tried a biochemistry lab, a chemical biology lab, and then I, of course, I did a synthesis lab. And while I liked this, the chemical synthesis, I really enjoyed um, applying some of what I had learned in my undergraduate degree with, in chemistry uh, to biological systems. And so I started, you know, venturing out a little bit. My, my, the graduate lab that I chose did offer me some chances to do some synthesis, but we, we used the molecules that we made. We tried testing them on um, enzymes that we wanted to study, learning about 
um, drug interactions with, with proteins and enzymology um, and, you know, measuring uh, enzyme activity, you know, with, with the, the frame of mind of a chemist, thinking about how do molecules change when an enzyme is inhibited. Um, and so, you know, I learned a lot about mass spectrometry and I really got a, a large um, variety of, of, of training and research during my graduate career. Um, and I think that really perfectly kind of led me into this project representative role, you know, and Tracy and Doug have, have kind of described it, but I work not only with the, the folks at PDM who, who do a lot of the, the ADME science and, and the research, um, you know, with a focus on PDM, but I have to take that work, I have to understand it, and then I have to explain that to other colleagues, uh, like people like chemists or people like biologists who are, who are really more focused on their own lines work. Um, and so I really enjoy that, that give and take that, that the project representative gets to, to have, where not only are you representing PDM um, and, and ADME sciences, but you're, you're relaying that to other groups and making sure that every partner line at Pfizer, whether that's chemistry, biology, PDM, everyone is aligned and working as a team to progress that drug through the pipeline. Um, and so I've had a really great experience uh, at, at Pfizer. It's been about two years, two and a half years so far. Um, but I think, you know, if you're interested in a project representative role, you should go more into a graduate degree. Um, if you really like doing more of the lab work, the science, um, a, a bachelor degree is probably uh, a better a better path for you. Maybe uh, Ali can go next and, and talk a little bit about her experience uh, as an enzymologist. I'll nominate you, Ali. <laughs> Sure. Um, so I graduated from my bachelor's degree um, at URI. It was in pharmaceutical science um, in 2013. And my first job right out of college was with Pfizer. Um, however, I did have some lab experience before that. Um, I My first internship was at a pharmaceutical company as like a pre-formulation um, intern. Um, and then, you know, after you get your first internship, the other ones kind of come in a lot easier. So getting the first one is always the hardest. Um, my internship after that was um, in an enzymology lab, actually. Um, I had another internship working in pharmacokinetics after that. And then my last internship before I graduated was um, in like a molecular ecology lab doing like PCR. Uh, and then I joined Pfizer in this enzymology group. So I had like a nice flavor of what I was going to be doing from my undergrad um, in enzymology, um, you know, you're doing a lot of in vitro assays. So as Jane mentioned, um, you know, a bachelor's or master's degree is what most people in my group have. However, the people who do have PhDs tend to be, you know, managers. Um, however, that's not always the case. So uh, if you do want to get a PhD, you just come in at a higher scientist level, but you're expected to kind of like lead the science and lead the publications and stuff like that. I guess I'm the last one le left. Yep. And so uh, my name is George Chang. Uh, and I think uh, very similar to all the themes you guys have heard so far, uh, I mean, the, uh, the undergraduate college experience is very influential. And so uh, I went to Pomona College as an undergraduate. Um, and I had a professor who was uh, very influential in terms of guiding me towards medicinal chemistry. Uh, and I think Tracy's described what the, the what a medicinal chemistry is part, and part of this whole scheme. And so I went off to graduate school specifically in medicinal chemistry, uh, sort of very much like James. Uh, we were essentially synthetic chemists, but uh, the compounds we were synthesizing were strictly uh, for medicinal purposes and not for um, you know paint products and so on. Uh, and then after that, um, uh, I decided to sort of broaden my scope a little bit. And so I did a postdoc uh, at Columbia uh, doing computational work um, because I, at that point I became very interested in seeing whether we could use computers to design uh, drugs in a better way or more intelligent way. And so I spent uh, a couple of years at Columbia doing postdoc. Uh, but again, the theme here is, is, you know, is, you know, being as inquisitive as you could possibly can and just keep learning new stuff. I mean, I think the skills you learn along the way will be invaluable to you later on. Uh, not necessarily the skill itself, but, but actually just the, the concept of always, you know, being inquisitive and learning and approach new things. Um, I joined Pfizer, uh, hmm. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, 32 years ago, uh, and uh, I've never left. Uh, it's been a great company. Uh, I, I was a medicinal chemist for the first 18 years, and then uh, this company is 
very large with a lot of, lot of opportunities. And so about uh, 13, 14 years ago, uh, I managed to uh, switch my roles and I joined the PDM group in the computational anatomy. And so, I mean, that group that basically takes the hundreds of thousands of data points and try to model that using AI. And so uh, it's, it's been a, and that's what I'm, that's my role is right now. And it's just, uh, it's been a great, great journey, great trip. Highly recommend it. <laughs> Thanks, George. So at, at this point, you know, this was all the material that we had, we wanted to, to give to you guys. We wanted to tell you a little bit about the science we do in our, our own personal career paths. But um, at this point, we'd like to open it up. And we're really hoping that, you know, you'll feel free to ask us questions about anything you've heard today. Um, anything, you know, you, you'd like to ask for, you know, career advice or anything else. Um, we're really hoping to have a good discussion with you. And so we'd like to open it up. And if someone would like to go ahead and ask a question to get us started, that would be terrific. So maybe I'll, I'll start by asking all of you a question. Uh, what kind of majors are, are you taking or do you have minors or what, what's your focus for your undergraduate degrees? And you can go ahead and place that in the chat. Um, we do have a comment in the chat. It says uh, from Alex, good afternoon. I'm sorry that I'm unable to speak aloud currently. I was hoping to ask questions in the chat. So Alex, go ahead and, and place the question in the chat. <laughs> and please don't be shy to our students. Um, you can either unmute yourself, use the raise your hand option in the reactions, or you can place your, com uh, your questions in the comments, in the chat. Okay, we have a hand raised. Um, Akshay, go ahead and, and you can unmute yourself. Um, hi, yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, like, um, so you mentioned that you use like um, stuff like uh, AI to like um, determine like new like um, 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 to determine like new like um, to determine like um, sorry like uh, um, sorry I, like I stutter, but um, but you use like stuff like um AI for example to like determine like new like um um like um uh who like to, to to like um determine like new like um molecules like um that could be like a, that could be like um that could be like um that could be like um um that could be like a um that could be like um sorry um that could be like a um that could be like a um I could be like a, um, I could be like a, sorry, um, I could be like a, I could be like a, that could be like a, um, I could be like a, like that could be like a potential like a drug target. It's like, I was just wondering like how how you go about that whole process. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I was I was supposed to take that. So, uh, so that's that's a great question. Thanks very much. And so, uh, I mean, clearly AI is very much uh, in the news right now. Uh, and um, I mean, essentially, in a, in a nutshell, what we're really using is the ability of the computer uh, to um, see patterns uh, across many, many data that a human cannot see easily. And more importantly, to, to be able to see patterns that is not biased. I mean, we will look at certain things and be very biased in terms of how we think about it. I mean, a computer presumably should not be biased. There's a lot more caveat to that, but it, it by itself uh, doesn't know anything. And so it needs to be fed. And so in answer to your question specifically, um, you know, we work very closely with groups like HDO, uh, the, the other group that basically generates the data. Uh, the AI machine, the computer essentially needs data to be able to look for patterns and then from the pattern, answer questions that you may have. Uh, 
And so to be very specific, right? So, so we will create a model that will predict whether a compound will be once a day, have a long, uh, long half-life, it's not clear very quickly, or the compound that has a very short life, in which case you need to, be ta- you need to take it three times a day. We can predict those kind of things. But, but the only way we know that is because we have hundreds of thousands of other molecules that have patterns would teach us whether that particular structure will have a long half-life or a short half-life. And so because of the knowledge, a computer can learn and it can learn looking at hundreds of thousands that a, a human would have a very hard time doing. That's essentially how that works. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so you're basically using like our previous like assays that have been done on similar molecules. And... A- absolutely. I, oh, I, I, okay. I'm, not, I'm not familiar with any, to be honest, I'm not familiar with any AI type machines. It could be, I'm just, I'm not familiar with them that it does not need input to be able to actually do something useful. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Um, thank you so much for answering my question. No, no, absolutely. Thank you. Wonderful. We have another great. question in the chat. Oh, sorry, Doug. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so Yuki said, hello. Thank you all for sharing your experiences. Would you be able to share any opportunities within Pfizer that are a little less research heavy? I was a social science major, um, more focus on science communication, but with research experience and coursework in the sciences. Yeah, sure. I, I can take a stab at that. Um, <clears throat> so, so we're here, you know, we're all scientists or trained as scientists representing a particular department. Um, but you should realize that Pfizer is a, a really big company. And so we represent only a, a, a small fraction of it. Um, and so Pfizer has many different um, scientific departments. Uh, but they also have different things. Um, you know, we have a communications department. Um, some of that is handled locally, like on our site. There's folks that work in, in communications and site affairs. Um, but we also have a, a group of people that work in government relations. And so their job is to interact with governments at, at all levels, um, federally, um, statewide, and, and local levels as well and to make sure that they understand what Pfizer business is and what the science is. And they're trying to understand from legislators, for example, if they're proposing laws, they try to understand <clears throat> how they're gonna affect Pfizer. And you know, as, as a law is formed, you know, they, they will take input. And so we have people in our communication department who will help um, communicate the message that and the points that Pfizer wants to make. Um, you know, we have groups that interact with the media. Um, you can imagine that, you know, a lot of people may want to speak with scientists, especially around something as high profile as the development of the vaccine. Um, so we have people who specialize in, in that. So there's a lot of um, different aspects around that utilize the science, if you will. And so if, if you have coursework and some background and some knowledge of the science, um, that always makes your job and those other, other functions a lot easier to do. Yeah, so, one, I was gonna say one thing to add to Doug, as I was looking at this, you know, I work directly with a group of medical writers and you know, that's a way to communicate the science, but it's in a written way. So having the understanding of scientific terminology and how to present that, um, you know, it's a, it's a very large group within Pfizer actually that's becoming and growing even more. Um, so that may be something to, to kind of think about again, um, definitely not lab-based, not research heavy at all, but writing about the science and communicating it that way. Did that answer your question or give a, a good start on it? Excellent. All right, we have another um, one in the chat. Good afternoon from Alex. I'm currently relatively early in my undergraduate career um, as a biochemistry major on a pre-health track. I have performed some bioinformatics research previously, but I was hoping to ask whether anyone could speak to the internships they pursued during their undergraduate tenures, where many of the uh, in parentheses research question mark opportunities that you pursued um, pharmacology adjacent or were they more uh, 
generically aligned with wet lab or computational science as a whole. So I can, I can take a stab at answering that or at least give my own personal experience. Um, so when I was at Hofstra University for my undergraduate uh, degree, um, we had a lot, of, um, a lot of different research opportunities or internship opportunities presented to us by um, our advisors who we were doing research with. So um, I worked with uh, someone named Dr. Sobel who had a couple of collaborations um, at Vanderbilt University and um, she was able to help me apply for an internship at Vanderbilt University over a summer. So I did a summer internship there and I really enjoyed my experience over the summer and I applied to them for graduate school because I, I really liked you know, how their university ran things. They had a, a very close medical center uh, aligned with the, under, with the university that did research. Um, but just that experience helped me, first of all, probably get accepted into Vanderbilt's graduate uh, program. But also, uh, it just helped me learn a lot more about what graduate level research was like. So if you're interested in graduate school, that's one opportunity that I would suggest. Maybe look into uh, what graduate programs you like. Uh, try to see if they offer any summer internships that you can go to. And maybe your research advisors can help you do that. Um, but, you know, there are also plenty of um, industry or pharmaceutical uh, internships available. Pfizer also offers those themselves. That's going to be something that's much more like pharmacology adjacent, drug related. Um, the, the research that I did at Vanderbilt was not necessarily, you know, PDM or ADME related. Um, I was doing something actually a little bit involved with uh, biochemical engineering and biomedical engineering. Um, and so I was watch, I, I was monitoring a chemical reaction using microfluidic devices. And so that doesn't really have anything to do with um, you know, add me specifically, um, but just the research opportunities are, 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 you know, a way that you can learn about how general research is done in a lab, what kind of graduate research um, lab experiences are, uh, are available to you or, or what they're like. Um, so even if it's not a pharmacology adjacent um, field, you should still definitely take on some, some research internship um, opportunities if, if they're available, because that'll, first give you an experience of just, if you like research, if you wanna do something like that, um, what kind of path is forward, uh, is there for you? Uh, and then also, you know, if you're interested in going to graduate school to continue doing research, or if you wanna more just apply the research that you've done in, in undergrad to a job right away. So definitely things to think about, but um, that's a very attractive thing to add to your CV uh, as an undergrad. So if you're applying for a job or if you're applying to a graduate program, it's definitely helpful to have some kind of uh, research internship or just even just in your own lab uh, at, at your university. Yeah, yeah, and I can speak to this a little bit too. Um, we've hired a lot of entry-level bachelor's uh, scientists in my group in the last few years. And I would say, even if you have internships that are not exactly for a job that you're applying for, I know we just like to see you know, is this person trainable? How did they do when learning new things in the lab? How does um, their PI speak of them at their experience? And how, you know, how do they get along with the group? Um, you know, so it's okay that if, you know, just having some experience in the sciences is, is definitely useful. It doesn't have to be spot on for maybe your dream job. And I would just add on to what Ali and James has said, it's, it's Pfizer does have an internship program and uh, <clears throat> it has a specific um, application date, which is usually around the November, December timeframe. Um, so if, if you go to our website and uh, search for summer internships, you'll find some information. Um, so I don't know what openings would be available for, for next summer, but um, the deadlines are in, as I said, in the November, December timeframe. So if you wanted to check that out, um, I, I would just echo what Ali and, and James have said. I'm, I'm a big fan of internships, um, you know, for, for doing them. <laughs> um, besides, you know, getting some exposure to something you may be interested in, um, it can be equally interesting and informative to tell you about things you may not like. <laughs> and that's equally important to figure out when you're trying to decide where your career is going to take you. So you may think something may be um, really fun and really exciting. And, you know, you may spend a summer doing it and find out, 
gee, I really couldn't see myself doing that for, for, you know, a big chunk of the next stage of my career. So that's an important thing to learn. And so it's a really valuable piece of information for you. And so I, I would, if you have opportunities, um, you know, within colleges, sometimes universities, research labs will have um, opportunities for internships. And as Ali said, as an employer, it's not necessarily the specifics of the research you did, it's some of the skills you learned. And uh, that's, that's really what we're, um, what, we're, what we're looking for at that stage. I actually just thought of a really funny example of um, kind of an, an example of what we're saying. We just hired um, an entry level scientist like a couple of years ago and her lab experience was like studying the behavior of cockroaches and we hired her into an entomology lab but you know she had great communication skills you know she did her research very well and thorough and her um personal recommendations were really great so you know she was highly trainable and you know she's been great in our group so you know don't feel disheartened if you know in your internship isn't exactly what you want to do because it can still get you the job that you want Thank you all so much. Um, any other questions? I know we are at 5.46 p.m., um, but any last questions that any of our students have? Uh, since we're waiting for questions, if I can just sort of chime in a little bit to Alice's question. I guess I actually read your question a little bit differently from all the other people. And so I'll, I'll see if we can try to address this based on uh, what you had mentioned about a computational science internship. And so um, perhaps a little bit different twist there. If you were going to, to be interested in doing a computational science internship, uh, you may not necessarily need to do one that the modeling or the computational work you'd be, you'd be doing is pharmaceutically related. Uh, if you did a computational science research that, you know, tried to look at how uh, how to increase coffee crops uh, under different soil conditions, uh, nothing related, but but the techniques that you will learn from doing that can be applied to almost anything you you could do, uh, because again, where right, it's just the, the data that goes in, the understand the the theory behind building models and whatever comes out. And so given the data, what, what comes into what's needed to grow an optimum co uh, coffee bean crop um, can be applied to almost anything you want. And so in that particular case, but again, echoing what everybody said, get that experience, it'd be great. Whether it's outside internally at the school, it's that on hand experience is fantastic. Good luck. Yeah, fantastic. So Doug and I have listed our contacts here. Um, you guys are, are free. If you have any questions at any time, you can reach out to either one of us and um, or, you know, through Gianna. Um, but uh, thank you. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much from the Pfizer team um, for joining us tonight. I just started a poll. Um, if our students can please, please, please fill it out um, just to let us know how we did. Did you like the event? Um, which is strongly recommended to others. Um, we always appreciate the feedback. So thank you all. I'll stick around for another five minutes just to make sure that the poll gets filled out. Thank you very much, everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you.